So this is my little reference dipole antenna that I used some time ago now and I use this as a uh, yardstick when using my network analyzer after I've uh, calibrated it I have a scalar network analyzer so actually calibrating it isn't uh, the big job that a uh, vector network analyzer requires but I uh, use this as I say as a yardstick just to uh, test other antennas against just so I know I've got this reference point I know exactly how this uh, performs so I can gauge the other antennas that I'm testing against this now I've wanted to make a new one of these for some time now and specifically making it from uh, silver silver is a, a slightly better conductor than copper although there's not a great deal between them but uh, a lot of people have asked on uh, previous videos uh, when they've seen me make say prototypes out of coat hanger wires which are predominantly uh, steel and uh, other materials whether there be any uh, real difference and uh, you know making the antenna from copper would it be better than say aluminium so uh, what I've got, I've got some materials in to make uh, a little reference dipole out of silver. So I thought I'd talk about that a little bit first and also talk about the uh, wavelengths that I choose to use with certain different types of antennas. So here's a list of uh, metals then ranked by their conductive properties. So we've got the best at the top here, which is silver. And down at the bottom here, we've got uh, steel right down at the bottom. But there are different grades of steel. So if we look at the ones at the top here, we've got silver, copper, gold and aluminium. Now, when it comes to uh, constructing antennas, you normally find the majority of them made out of copper or aluminium. And to be perfectly honest, in the real world, as an antenna, for instance, there's not a great deal between these two. But if you were producing a circuit to use uh, on a piece of test equipment where accuracy is your number one priority what you would want to do is uh, make your traces on your circuit board out of silver and then coat that silver tracks with gold now the reason you would do that is because silver is a uh, better conductor than gold but silver tarnishes so what you would do to stop that is coat them in gold you can even find uh, circuit boards that are made from copper coated in silver so you get the uh, you know the uh, conductive properties of the silver as well and then coated in gold so you've got three layers there now as for constructing an antenna out of uh, silver and gold you know it's it's over the top i don't think in the real world you're going to see much difference if you operated it say over wi-fi but uh, that's just one thing that i wanted to point out there is a big difference between uh, an antenna for instance and uh, test equipment you know an antenna made for uh, test equipment as a calibration tool is going to be a precise antenna and it's going to be made from these uh, more expensive uh, metals and uh, coated in gold so when i'm making an antenna for wi-fi i'm not going to use these uh, materials here because the expense really uh, you know you don't get anything back for that uh, expense you're not going to see any kind of difference in the real world the only time you're going to see a difference is if you hook it up to a network analyzer in uh, ideal conditions in a proper lab you know in a anechoic chamber and then you'll see a uh, difference in percentage but that'll be really really small and as i say you're not going to get that benefit in the real world so next I want to quickly go over the wavelength measurements that I sometimes use in the designs and why I don't stick to one uh, measurement length throughout uh, the different antennas that I build for instance. So what we've got here is the uh, general equation that uh, everybody knows and uh, what you've got here is wavelength and wavelength equals the wave speed over the frequency and then you get the measurement of the wavelength to uh, operate at a uh, specific frequency for instance. Now from all the antennas that I've built over the last few years this one has the uh, most negative comments where people will say you know 25 millimeters is not the wavelength at 2.4 gigahertz 
this guy doesn't know what he's talking about if you uh, have a look on some of my older videos where I've shown how to make these you'll find them in the comments but uh, there's uh, a certain thing with uh, a designing an antenna that also has to be taken into account it's not just this equation here there's a lot more going on when it comes to uh, say the materials you're making it out of and the uh, design of the antenna itself now the bottom fed dipole is an extreme example how a design can influence the uh, length of the wavelength and still keep it at center frequency for instance but uh, if we uh, take the cantenna and uh, the biquad for instance there are two antennas but uh, there is a slight difference between them both now with the cantenna depending on the diameter of the tubing that you choose to make the uh, cantenna out of uh, the monopole tends to be the measurement tends to be about uh, 30 0.8 millimeters to stay at center frequency at 2.4 gigahertz and the reason why that is slightly shorter than uh, what i would normally use is because the cantenna is inductive and if the antenna is inductive it means it's too long so you have to shorten the driven element in order to keep it at that center frequency so when you compare that to the biquad the biquad is slightly capacitive so the wavelength that i choose the quarter wavelength i choose to make the uh, biquad out of will be 31.5 millimeters so slightly longer than the element for the cantenna and that's because the biquad is capacitive it's, if it's capacitive it's too short so you've got to make it slightly longer and the cantenna is in inductive design so it's too long so you've got to make it slightly shorter so the equation here you should just use that as a uh, reference point to start off with when you're uh, prototyping an antenna you know and designing an antenna because uh, there's other things that need to be taken into consideration and when you find uh, you know you can google uh, the wavelength at 2.4 gigahertz uh, you've got to remember as well that uh, that equation is working in uh, free space so it's propagating in uh, ideal conditions that you would never get in the real world sometimes uh, it's worked out in a vacuum as well the uh, materials that it assumes that uh, you know this wavelength is being propagated from are ideal materials with next to no loss whatsoever so you have to factor in a lot more to design an antenna the materials that you use the dielectrics and the conditions that it's going to be used under and uh, how you're going to use it as well and what you're going to use it for so there's a lot that goes into uh, the art of designing an antenna it's not just as simple you know like uh, paint by numbers I've got this uh, equation here I just cut my copper wire off and then I've got an antenna there's a lot more to it than just this equation alone now I've recently picked up this book and uh, to be honest this book it, today is obsolete it's not really uh, something I'm going to use but it's a nice piece of history to show that uh, it's not just about the wavelength other factors uh, come into play when deciding the length of the wavelength you're going to use for an antenna now during world war ii uh, radar really came into play and uh, you know the importance of radar by the end of the war was seen that uh, you know most countries needed radar and they could also be used for uh, other things as well not just for warfare but uh, more importantly the uh, microwave engineers that emerged from uh, the end of 1945 had no real test equipment to test against so Sperry Gyroscope an American company came up with this book that just details different materials different metals different dielectrics and uh, gives formulas that you can uh, add in uh, to the uh, original formula to work out uh, wavelength for instance and then you can uh, add this equation in as well so you can get uh, the, a more precise wavelength depending on the materials you're going to use so this is just uh, a list of different materials and uh, their impact 
on uh, wave propagation at microwave frequencies and originally in 1944 it was uh, a confidential but um, by the time uh, August the 1st came around 1945 it was then declassified to restricted and uh, later on of course it was uh, you know not obsolete so this is just a nice book and uh, they do mainly concentrate on cavities um you know waveguides because that's what they used for radar back then but it's just a list of uh, different formulas to uh, factor into your equations uh, for the different materials and how they can impact on the wavelength so it's just a nice book and i didn't pay a lot of money for it it's just uh, a nice piece of history how people had to do it back uh, then because there was no test equipment available for them to actually uh, you know look at this sort of thing so it was all done with a calculator and pencil and paper so these are the materials I'm going to make my little uh, silver reference antenna out of so I've got this uh, rigid coax here it is actually uh, copper coax copper rigid coax and it's uh, coated in uh, silver so it's got silver plate on this I've uh, got some thin wire here it's uh, 18 SWG and it's uh, sterling silver I've got this tube here now it's just slightly over 50 millimeters so I'm hoping I'm going to be make uh, be able to make two antennas from this tube and that's going to be the uh, ballon on the bottom fed dipole and I've also got these pieces here now uh, originally when I was looking on eBay I got these to be the ballon but uh, I went from the uh, measurement the length which is exactly 25 millimeters which will be perfect it means I don't have to cut it but uh, I was just going on the picture for the diameter so you can see it's a little bit too narrow but I am going to use those as the uh, driven element and this for the uh, body of the uh, ballon on the uh, little dipole antenna now this is sterling silver and I think its purity is about 94 percent pure and uh, mixed in with some other metals like copper but uh, it didn't cost me a great deal of money the most expensive piece was this uh, thicker tube in here this cost me 11 pounds with free shipping but the wire and these uh, smaller pieces of tube here didn't cost a great deal at all I think I paid about six pounds for both of these so I've got my ground plane tubing cut to size at 25 millimeters so I've popped it over the top of this rigid coax just so I can uh, estimate where to cut this off I've left about three millimeters from the base of the tube in here to the uh, start of the SMA connector I've got my uh, driven element tube in here the thinner stuff that I uh, ordered by mistake but I'm going to use it as the driven element and I'm going to leave about a millimeter gap between the driven element and the ground plane tube in here so I need to cut this rigid coax somewhere about here so I've got some of that inner core to play with because I'm going to strip away the uh, solid outer braid of this uh, coax and expose that inner core and solder the inner core up inside this thinner tubing so I'm going to cut this off about here and that'll give me uh, plenty of that inner core to play with so I've got my mark there where I'm going to cut the uh, coax short to and uh, what I've done I've used the tubing again to help me I've got that uh, little bit of a gap here and what I did I just pushed it up another couple of millimeters to there and put another mark here so uh, that is a mark where I'm going to expose the inner braid so I'm going to cut away this uh, outer uh, rigid braid here away to expose the inner braid and completely cut the coax off here so I've used this tube just to help me uh, you know estimate the uh, cuts there where I'm going to uh, expose and I've erred on the side of caution so I've got a few millimeters to play with that I can expose a little bit more when it comes to uh, soldering the tube in place along this uh, rigid coax here so I cut this using the cutting wheel on the Dremel tool and it really was a uh, tough nut to crack so I don't think the uh, copper grade of this uh, rigid coax is the same as the uh, copper piping in your home for instance but you can see now the uh, outer braid there and that inner uh, core and the dielectric surrounding both so I'm now ready to solder the ground plane tubing into place to construct this antenna and uh, what I've done I've put a little bit of tin around the top here on the outer braid 
of the coax so I can solder the tubing in place. I've also put some tin around the top of the tubing but uh, it's very important to insulate the rest of this rigid coax from the tubing. Not so much of an issue if you're using normal coax but when you're using rigid or semi-rigid coax it's important to use some heat shrink tubing just to insulate the rest of the tube from the coax otherwise the antenna won't work. And for the soldering I am using leaded solder for this it just works a lot better with uh, silver. If you uh, saw my video on the spectrum analyzer fix I did struggle a little bit with that uh, rigid coax and it turns out it was because I was using lead free solder. Now I do primarily use lead free solder here because it's been banned in uh, the schools in the UK for the past 10 years and I am a teacher uh, so I've just got used to using it but uh, lead solder does work a lot better with uh, this silver. So I've got that tubing soldered in place and what I'm going to do now is use a small file just to clean it up a little bit. And I don't know if it's just me but uh, this tube in here does seem to uh, conduct the heat a lot better than uh, copper tubing does. I uh, did burn my fingers a couple of times touching this when I was soldering it so if you're going to make one of these be really really careful about the heat you don't want to melt that uh, inner dielectric there so let it cool down in between applications. So I've cut away the dielectric to expose the inner core of the coax and I've bent it over double to add a little bit more volume. I've uh, left about one millimeter of the uh, inner dielectric there just to provide some insulation from the grounding tube and the uh, main driven element. So what I'm going to do is flood some solder onto that uh, inner core that I've bent over and hopefully I'll be able to feed this uh, smaller tube over the top of there, add a little bit of heat here and hopefully we'll get a good connection. So that's soldered in place and what I can do now is just clean that little uh, excess solder up with a small file. So here is the finished antenna then, solid silver elements and silver plated rigid coax. So it'll be interesting to see how this performs. So I thought it'd be interesting to do a real world test and test these three antennas all at the same time. I've got identical alpha cards here and uh, all three antennas are uh, basic bottom fed dipole, should give around uh, 2.5 dBm. So I've got a uh, retail one here, this is from TP-Link. I've got the uh, solid copper one that I made uh, some time ago and I've got the new solid silver one so I'll set up a little jig get them all lined up and uh, we'll run a test on each and see how well they perform and whether we can see any kind of difference just by doing a quick Wi-Fi scan or whether the difference really will only be spotted on a uh, network analyzer something like that so let's give it a test and see if we can spot anything so let's give them all a scan all at once. So we've got the uh, retail one first on the left. We've got the copper one in the middle, that'll be second. And we've got the silver one at the end, that'll be the third one that I scan. So let's start off first with the retail one. And now we'll scan the copper one. And now we'll scan the silver one. So what I'm going to do to make it a little bit easier, I'm just going to choose a uh, access point that I do tend to use as a reference source. So here's the access point here, it's uh, Game Wi-Fi and the retail one is pulling that in at 85% signal strength. And we'll find the same access point and the copper one's pulling in 86%. So 1% uh, more, I mean it's jumped up to 90 now so possibly it is working a little bit better than the retail one and the silver one is pulling in 98% so it's doing a lot better than the uh, retail one and the copper one it uh, pulled in 100% at one bit, that's the 100% it peaked at but now seems to be steady at 98% so whether there's something in uh, making an antenna out of silver or not I don't know but it's definitely uh, more impressive than the other two so let's have a quick look back at the uh, see if they've improved slightly the uh, retail one is still at 84% the copper one 
is still at well it's 86 percent peaked at 90 percent which dropped back down to 86 percent so a little bit better than the retail one but the silver one again up to 100 percent so possibly there's something in having a uh, antenna made purely out of silver being a better conductor i don't know i'll uh, just quickly flash back again so you can pause it if you want and compare some of the other access points so i'll have a look at this myself after uh, I've uh, recorded it just to view it again but uh, on that one access point it does seem to be uh, a lot better than the other two. So the end result from that test then was uh, a little bit surprising. I wasn't expecting such a huge gap over the three antennas and uh, you know it was 10% uh, better than the copper one and uh, the copper one was only a, about 2% better than the retail one. So uh, as I say, I wasn't expecting that outcome, but it does need uh, some more testing just to uh, make sure that it wasn't a fluke. Uh, probably hook this up to the network analyzer and see what the uh, SWR is and uh, the frequency response and things like that. But um, again, a little bit more testing and silver is a better conductor than copper. That is a fact, but um, whether you know it was all due just to the uh, silver it was just a fluke at the time i don't know but what i think i'm going to do now is uh, make another silver dipole antenna but make one of these uh, longer range versions because i have got a uh, different method to make the coil here that uh, you may find easier to uh, produce than uh, the original videos that I did uh, a couple of years ago showing you how to make one of these so I think I'll make one in silver and test it against this alpha dipole just to see if we get any difference between those two and I just wanted to quickly show you the uh, silver antenna on the network analyzer I've got it set up at the moment sweeping in the uh, 2.4 gigahertz region it's actually sweeping 2.1 gigahertz to 2.447 gigahertz which is the uh, highest that uh, this particular plug-in goes up to but I've got it uh, set up on the test rig on the bench now but just look at that waveform on the network analyzer you get that uh, drop right here at the center frequency bang in the middle of the 2.4 gigahertz range so we've got uh, 2 gigahertz about here and although the plug-in goes up to uh, 2.44 gigahertz it actually goes a little bit beyond that it's about 2.60 gigahertz there so we've got this lovely little dip here just what we actually need for a perfect antenna so i hope you found this video useful and any comments drop them below any uh, ideas that you think i could take this a little bit further and uh, some people have asked me in the past whether i'd make a uh, a silver plated uh, biquad yagi and i've always said no because i think it's just a bit of a gimmick but uh, maybe it isn't i don't know but uh, it's something to actually uh, think about for the future so as i say any comments drop them below any ideas on where i can actually uh, take this uh, further and uh, hopefully you'll join me on the next one